Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I do a lot of uh, uh, introductions of talks, but uh, very rarely do, do uh, the, the topic of the conversation fascinate me as, as much as, as this talk today. Um, some of you will, who, who know me will, will know that I'm, I'm, I'm basically myself a, a, a defrocked physicist. I, I, I did physics in the 70s in protein crystallography before I moved up uh, 10 orders of magnitude in the, in the early 80s to start working on brain. So it's great for me to, 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 uh, to get back and, and hear something about some of the stuff that I was learning in school back in the 70s. Um, uh, so we're, we're delighted to have a, a talk about basic physics, first of all, and aligned with that, a study of something that we're all fascinated with all the time, consciousness, what it, me what it means to be conscious. So bringing these two threads together is something of particular uh, excitement for me. And to have someone of the stature of uh, Lucien Hardy to give a, a talk, I think, is a special, special privilege. Uh, Lucien did his uh, PhD at the University of Durham and then uh, bounced around Europe in Ireland and uh, Rome and Innsbruck doing various postdocs, was an uh, ERF fellow at the University of Oxford before he uh, moved on to come to uh, the Perimeter Institute. And those of you who, who know, the Perimeter Institute is uh, one of the uh, uh, world's leading uh, institutions for theoretical physics and uh, quantum computing in particular. And Lucien has a, a strong background in uh, quantum theory at one end, general relativity at the other end, and the potential integration of these two uh, grand uh, uh, theories in, in the notion of quantum gravity. So uh, I don't know how much uh, Lucien will get into, into that per se. He's going to focus more on what quantum effects might have to tell us about consciousness. And obviously what we're interested in is uh, what could we do ourselves to uh, find ways to measure consciousness and, and uh, get a, an exploration into the inner workings of the human mind in a way that uh, I think is probably the fundamental question of, uh, of uh, human existence. So with that said, it's a pleasure to invite uh, Lucien to give uh, this uh, special Ludlow Center lecture. Lucien. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as I was walking here this morning through the snow up the hill, I, I knew I'd gotten to the, the right building when I saw on the wall, it said, um, in, in concrete, etched in concrete, the problem of neurology is to understand man himself. Um, and um, of course, that is, that is an interesting problem. Uh, my background is, is in quantum theory, quantum foundations in particular. I'm interested in some of the uh, some novel and surprising aspects of um, quantum theory. Um, and I've always had an interest in, in consciousness and I, I've developed that interest a bit more recently. Uh, there's, there's not much, of course, we can say, but I think it's interesting to explore these um, questions. Um, I think it, it's good to start with um, philosophical issues. Um, in quantum foundations, we often start with philosophical issues concerning uh, uh, reality, the nature of reality. Uh, here we're talking about consciousness, so let's look at some of the philosophical issues in uh, consciousness. Um, and uh, let's begin with a quote from Irving Ludmer. Um, he said, uh, one of the things I thought about when I was a young man studying particle physics at McGill was, how does matter create thought? And I think that's a great question. So I've created a, a graphic for that. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> um, so um, let's let's think about that a bit more. Uh, well, here here um, in in this center, um, uh, Alan and uh, and, and in, uh, collaborators elsewhere have uh, this uh, big brain data set. Uh, so this is they've taken a brain of a, a 65 year old uh, man um, and um, sliced it up into into 20 micron. Um, uh, slices, and there's several thousand of these slices, and then they've imaged them, and then you can go online, and you can look uh, at this brain. Uh, uh, you can focus. You can go down into down to the 20 micron uh, level and see all the detail of this brain. So this is an extraordinary, um, um, an extraordinary a achievement, and, and it's a, 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 a useful um, thing to look at if you want to understand the brain. And we could ask ourselves, you know, how far could we take this? What would be the 
the holy grail of um, this kind of approach, uh, the neuroinformatics inf uh, informatics holy grail. Um, and so here's an idea. The holy grail could be, incidentally, this is the holy grail taken from um, one of those um, um, Indiana Jones films. Um, this is the one that at, the, at the end he drinks from. Um, so the, the holy grail could be to have um, a non-invasive video imaging technique at a sufficiently high resolution, say one micron, so that would be the below the resolution uh, of, so you'd be able to see the neurons, uh, so that we can see all the pertinent details of the brain with small enough time step, because this is a video imaging technique, between subsequent images. So I'm not sure what that time step would be, maybe at the millisecond uh, level. So if you had that, um, what would you do with it? Well, first of all, you could think of this as, as corresponding to um, uh, to a, a time series of, of, of um, images. So at time zero, you have uh, uh, an image which you can encode, encode as a series of zeros and ones. Then at time one, you can do that and so on. So you'd have a, so your data set could correspond uh, to this series of zeros and ones. Okay. Well, one thing you might want to do with that would be um, to uh, associate uh, it with brain function. So can come up with the brain function informatics holy grail. Uh, the idea here is to use this data set uh, to identify the mechanisms in the brain which are associated with different brain functions. You know, brain functions like discriminating stimuli, reporting internal states, controlling behavior, solving, solving partial differential equations, uh, and so on, all the sorts of things that humans do. Um, um, if you had that, then you would have a, a complete characterization um, between uh, what was happening in the brain as seen in this data set uh, and reports of mental states. So um, reports, when, when, when somebody says something like, I see green, uh, I'm imagining playing tennis, uh, all this sort of, all this sort of um, reports of mental states would be there correlated with, um, with um, mechanisms inside the brain. Uh, identifying these mechanisms is what the philosopher uh, David Chalmers called the easy problem of consciousness. Uh, and I don't think he was trying to be offensive. Um, this problem, although he calls it the easy problem, is in, in fact incredibly um, difficult. Um, but it's, it's to contrast it with uh, what he calls the hard problem of consciousness. So this is the hard problem of consciousness. Uh, explain how it is possible that there are sensations, for example, like seeing the color green. These are often called qualia. Uh, by philosophers. Um, so in, in addition to there being things in the brain that correlate with a sensation, such as seeing the color green, there's also the, the sensation itself that you will experience um, of seeing the color green. Um, this is the, sort of conscious experiences, if you like. Um, this, this photograph is, is actually a of, of, of David Chalmers is actually a screen capture uh, of him singing the zombie blues. And if you go on YouTube, you can listen to this. I'm not going to perform it because I don't have the, the same skill. Um, here, here are the words. So there's a zombie in philosophy, a philosophical zombie is, is, a, is a hypothetical creature who is just like uh, a human, behaves in the same way as a human, um, uh, and, and yet is not conscious, has no uh, inner experience, has no sensations, uh, and so on. So here are the words. I act like you act. I do what you do, but I don't know what it's like to be you what consciousness is, I ain't got a clue, I got the zombie blues. Um, okay, again, go and watch the YouTube video, it's much better. Um, well, um, so let's think a bit about what the problems are. We all, we all sense that it's very difficult to give an exp uh, to, to ex ex explain consciousness. We all have that, uh, that sense. Um, but philosophers have thought about this a bit more and um, here are three arguments about why it's difficult to give a materialist account, that's an account in terms of, um, of matter, um, of consciousness. So the first um, problem is, is, um, is the explanatory argument. The kinds of explanations that we um, typically have in, materialist, in the materialist accounts do not appear to be suited for explaining the emergence of something like consciousness. Um, it seems hard to imagine how consciousness emerges uh, purely, say, from the complex um, behavior in, in brains. It's not necessarily impossible that that could be the case, but it's hard to 
understand how that argument works. Um, the second argument uh, has to do with the, the zombies I just mentioned. Um, um, so it's the conceivability argument. If it's possible to logically conceive of zombies, of philosophical zombies, creatures that behave like us uh, but are not conscious, um, then um, the, the thing that is the explanation of consciousness cannot be in the sequence of brain states because it's possible to conceive of creatures having the same sequence of brain states which are not conscious. This is a, a typical philosophy argument, um, but I think it's quite compelling. Uh, the only an argument against this would be, would be that actually you cannot conceive of zombies, um, and so that you could try and make that case. The third argument uh, is the knowledge argument. Um, all these arguments, I've, I've taken them from a paper by David Chalmers, uh, but he, he um, summarized these from various papers in the literature. Um, so the third, third argument is the knowledge argument. So imagine you have a scientist who knows absolutely everything there is to know about how the brain proce uh, processes color vision, uh, but he's never actually seen the color red. You might imagine for whatever reason he's been locked in a room all his life um, uh, and the color red was never uh, evident in that room. But when he sees the color red for the first time, does he learn something that he, he didn't know already? So remember, he's a, he knows everything there is to know about color vision. Uh, he studied all the books. Uh, and yet, when he sees the red for the first time, it seems like he has a new experience. Um, so that's the question. Um, and it seems that these problems are serious. Uh, and in order to, um, um, to get around them, we need some sort of explanatory. Well, I looked for a long time for the right word. Uh, and I came up with the word umph. It's not clear how we get around these problems. We need some kind of explanatory omph to break through this. Um. There's another problem. It's, it's, it's conceptually separate, I think, from the problem of consciousness. And this is the problem of cognition. Um, so the problem of cognition would be to delineate the cognitive abilities of humans. Um, so it seems that humans have all sorts of abilities such as insight, intuition, uh, creativity. There's a long list. Um, and, and, these and, and it's sometimes argued that these are abilities that computers uh, 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 or don't have and couldn't have in principle. So Roger Penrose, who you see pictured there, has argued that. Uh, and here is an example he gave. This is a chess problem. Um, uh, and um, it's, it's White's move. And White has to try and play for a draw. So apparently, when he gave this chess problem to uh, uh, computers, you know, the computers that had beaten humans uh, in, in games, uh, the computers uh, did the wrong thing, and they, they made it so that white would lose. Um, but actually, you can see that um, all white has to do is, is move uh, the king uh, on the white squares, just keep the king on the white squares, uh, and, and, wha and, and, and then white can never be uh, checkmated. And so if this is something that humans can see very quickly. And then the argument is, well, okay, we, we could, we could um, build computers that would, see th would be able to solve this problem. But then uh, Roger argues, well, that may be true, but I can come up with another problem that will beat those computers. Uh, and so is it the case that, um, that computers um, could never have the cognitive ability of humans? That's a, a question. Um, we can imagine simulating the brain with a, a computer that lives inside a, a robot's head. Uh, would this, would this uh, simulation be conscious? Would it have thoughts? Would it have sensations? Would it have the same cognitive abilities uh, as a human? These are all questions uh, we can ask. Okay, let me talk about um, quantum theory. Um, and here is the most basic um, experiment in quantum theory. If you understand this experiment, then you understand the heart of quantum theory. So we have here what's called a quantum interferometer. Uh, we have in the circle, there's an S inside it, that's a source, it has a button on it, you press the button and it releases a particle, a quantum particle, like an electron for example. And then the electron arrives and it arrives at the first um, beam splitter, okay that's the first um, line just here. Uh, and, and then it's possible for the electron to take one of two paths. It can either go along <coughs> along uh, path one, 
or along path two. So path one is here, or path two is here. And then it arrives at the second beam splitter, and then after the second beam splitter, there are two detectors, C and D. Um, so here's an empirical fact about quantum theory. Uh, if the difference between these two internal path lengths is zero, so if this path length two is, is exactly equal to this path length one, uh, then the particle is always detected at, elect at, at detector C. Okay, you can do a calculation. This is a prediction of quantum theory and this has been seen in experiments. Um, on the other hand, if the difference between the path lengths is equal to a certain amount, um, the, the wavelength associated with the particle divided by two, then the particle will always be detected at D. Um, okay, so that's a prediction of quantum theory that's been borne out in, in experiments. Um, now, if you imagine this particle is going along and it o only goes along one of the paths, how could it possibly do that? So let's think about it. Let's imagine the particle goes along, it takes path two, and then it arrives at this beam splitter, and now it has to decide, and I'm talking um, as if the particle is thinking, um, just the, the now, it, now the behavior has to be such that the particle either goes into C or D. If path length one is equal to path length two, it has to go into C. If on the other hand, path length one is different from two by half the wavelength, it has to go up to D. But since the particle didn't go along path one, it has no way of knowing uh, what that path length is equal to. So it's no way it can, uh, it can do this. It can't reproduce this behavior I've just described to you. Um, and this, this, is, this is one of the mysteries of, um, well, a mystery of quantum theory. This is, this is something that happens in quantum theory. And it seems like the only way to explain this is to say that something goes along both paths. So usually in quantum theory, you say, well, there's actually a wave function um, and, and part of the wave goes along the path two, part of it goes along path one, and then these two waves meet at the, at the second beam splitter, uh, and there's a uh, wave interference that determines whether it goes into paths, into, into this detector or this detector. Um, if you look, on the other hand, if you put the detectors on the internal paths, so if you put a detector in path one and a detector in path two, and you look to see where the particle is, you only see it in one of those two places. Um, so you don't detect something in both paths, even though it seems like something is going along bo both paths. Furthermore, if you look and see where the particle is, you can do this in a way that doesn't actually absorb the particle, so the particle carries on afterwards, um, then um, these predictions here are no longer true. So you break the interference if you place detectors into the paths of this interferometer. Okay. So something goes along both paths. Um, and mathematically, this is treated by writing the quantum state down like this. Uh, and this isn't really very difficult. You're just saying that you have path one and you put it inside this, this, um, this symbols here. It's called a ket. It doesn't really matter. It's just a way of saying path one as a thing. And then here path two. And then you have a weight alpha and a weight beta that tells you how much it's in path one and how much it's in path two. So, so if it's equally in those two paths, those weightings are equal. Um, okay, so that's the way mathematically you treat uh, a quantum superposition uh, when you have both things happening at the same time. Um, well, quantum, quantum theory is, is, is very interesting. That's why I spent my lifetime studying it. Um, uh, there's, there's all sorts of facts, and of course I don't have time to, to go through and give you a full introduction to quantum theory. Um, but here's a few, uh, here's a few facts. Uh, if you have a quantum system given to you, it's impossible for you to determine all the information that is in its quantum state. Okay, if you, um, if you, you can measure some of that information, but you can't extract all of it. Uh, also, you can't clone quantum states. So if somebody gives you a quantum system, and they don't tell you what state it's in, it's impossible for you to produce a second system that has the same state without destroying the first system. So you can't make, you can't clone quantum states. Um, any measurement you do make on the quantum state will disturb the quantum state. Um, 
any, any measurement that extracts information. There's, there's lots of interesting um, quantum phenomena. Uh, here's one example, quantum teleportation. So I told you that you cannot clone a quantum state. Uh, but nevertheless, there is a way to make measurements on a quantum state in one location and, um, and then reproduce that information, the quantum information uh, about the state in a different location. Uh, and you use that, to do that, you need something called quantum entanglement uh, and classical communication. Uh, so I mentioned this example because um, uh, Gilles Brassard, who's at the University of Montreal, uh, and Clau uh, Clau Claude uh, Capot, who is here at McGill in the Computer Science Department, uh, are two of the authors on, on this uh, paper that came out, I think, in 1994, a very significant uh, paper. Um, a qubit, um, well, in quantum computers, we have things called qubits. Uh, so qubit is a superposition between two, um, two mutually exclusive possibilities. So it could be um, a superposition of path one and path two, like the example I just gave you, or it could be something else. Um, so qubit is the quantum generalization of a classical bit. So in a computer, you have zeros and ones, which might be represented by different voltages living inside a transistor. Um, a qubit um, is, is the quantum version of that, where you have a superposition of um, two uh, mutually ex ex uh, exclusive states. Uh, and this coin was termed by Ben Schumacher. Um, and and um, here it is in the Scrabble dictionary. Um, um, and th there's a picture of Ben Schumacher. Uh, I was quite pleased with this slide, so I sent it to Ben Schumacher, uh, who responded almost instantly. Um, when I say instantly, I mean, it, it took him a day, but that's very, qu that's very quick for him. Um, uh, with this response, 16 points, no less, which is a, a mathematically precise statement. Um, um, so in a quantum computer, you have lots of qubits, uh, and they interact with each other, um, and, um, uh, and you act on them with, with quantum gates. So here is, is a sort of picture of a quantum computer uh, each of these boxes represents quantum gates where the, the qubits interact with each other. And at each stage in the evolution of the quantum computer, you have a different state. Uh, I've represented here, you see a state, now you have lots of qubits, so you have the superposition of, 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 of different states for those qubits. Uh, many different states, so you have a superposition of you know, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, blah, 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 plus, a with plus this one, 1, 0, 1, blah, blah, blah. Um, so in a quantum computer, you have these uh, superpositions um, of many different um, um, underlying states. Um, I've, I've got photographs here of, this is Richard Feynman and his David Deutsch. They're two of the pioneers, the early pioneers of, um, of the theory of quantum computation. What can a quantum computer do? Um, well, a quantum computer can effectively perform many calculations in parallel because you have this superposition of, um, of the um, underlying um, uh, the, the, the qubits, um, it's, sort of it's, it's, it's as if you're calculating, you're doing the calcula many calculations at the same time in parallel. Um, you can't actually look at the outcome of all those cal calculations in parallel. Uh, if you make a measurement, then you just see the result of one of them uh, and you lose all the information about the others. Uh, however, there are clever things you can do which look at properties um, of all the calculations in, in parallel. So there's clever quantum measurements you can make that allow you to do um, uh, quantum computation. So and and, and um, with a quantum computer, you can do things that, 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 um, that would take a classical computer a very long time. So one example is uh, factorizing large numbers. So if somebody gives you a, a, a number uh, and they tell you that that number is the product of two prime numbers, and they ask you to find, to tell them what the two prime numbers are. Um, so, you know, if the number is, is 15, that's quite easy, three times five. Um, um, on the other hand, if they give you a, 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 um, a number which has, um, say, 400 digits, so here's an example here. If you have a num number which has 400 digits, um, then on a classical two gigahertz computer, it would take uh, 1,200 billion years. Um, which is very many times the lifetime of the universe. 
the universe is about, I think, eight, 8 billion years old, if I'm not wrong, mistaken. Um, on the other hand, on a quantum computer, you could do it in one second. Um, if you had a quantum computer. They haven't, still haven't built quantum computers that can do this. Though they have built a quantum computer that can factorize 15. So I'm getting there. Yeah. Um, so what about, what has this got to do with um, uh, consciousness or the brain? Well, one question you can ask is, are there quantum processes happening in the brain that are relevant for I its functioning? I mean, obviously, there are quantum ha processes happening in the brain because quantum theory is the underlying physical theory there. But are those, are those processes relevant for the functioning of the brain? Um, and uh, various people have, uh, have proposed that this might be the case, starting with uh, Roger Penrose and Stuart Hammerhoff. Um, uh, and then more recently, um, there's a proposal from um, Matthew Fisher. Um, he, he says that uh, the, he, he identifies um, this, this uh, molecule CA6 uh, and, in, and in phosphate 8, so this, this particular molecule uh, as, a, as a candidate that may be able to contain uh, qubits uh, on the nuclear spins, uh, and, and furthermore, these qubits would be able to interact through um, chemical um, procedures so that these qubits could become entangled. So, 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 there's, um, so th there's a possible mechanism uh, there for um, quantum theory playing a role in the brain. Um, if it is the case that quantum theory is um, playing a role in brain function, um, then, um, then what would we do? What would be the, 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 the task uh, for, um, um, for uh, a neuroinformatics um, uh, laboratory? So this, was the, the, this is the task uh, before. Um, what if, 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 if there are, then what would be the, 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 the quantum neuroinformatics holy grail? What would be the, um, the thing we want to achieve? And I, I don't really have a good answer to that question. The, the, the the, the question is complicated because it's complicated by the fact that you cannot extract all the quantum information. So if the brain were actually quantum, then you wouldn't be able to determine all the information. Any measurement you made on the brain would disturb it, uh, change the state, and, and so you, you, would, you would possibly disturb the thing you were trying to, to measure, and you wouldn't extract all the information. So, so there's a question here, what, what would be the right theoretical structure uh, for something like this? Uh, and um, I've given a, a possible answer here would be to have a quantum video imaging technique at sufficiently high resolution that we can extract as many pertinent details of the brain with a small enough time step between subsequent images uh, 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 in, in such a way as, as is useful for the therapeutic needs at hand. Um, but what is interesting is that you could not, in the, in the classical case, you could in principle, you could get as much information as you want. There's no in principle limit as to how much information you could get about um, the state of the brain. Uh, as it evolves over time. I mean, in practice, of course, it's very difficult, but in, pr in principle, there's no limitation. Whereas in quantum theory, there is an in principle limitation. Are quantum robots conscious? Uh, if you um, put a quantum computer in the brain of a robot, does it become conscious? Does it have thoughts? Um, so it, it's not clear to me that you gain anything um, by replacing a classical computer with a quantum computer for explaining consciousness. I don't see how the three problems I talked about earlier, uh, the uh, ECK problems, are addressed just because you replace the classical computer with a quantum computer. Um, it seems to me that you still have the same problems. Um, what about cognition? Um, so quantum <laughs> computing in the brain would allow humans to complete some tasks much more quickly. So um, tasks like factoring large numbers. Um, um, but it doesn't change the classification of what is computable in principle. Um, so any, anything that can be done on a quantum computer can also be done on a classical computer. It just might take a lot more time. Um, it doesn't change the uh, in principle classification of what you can do. Um, there's also the question uh, of, of whether um, 
it would be to any evolutionary advantage to actually have um, quantum computing in the brain. And if it was, then, then, then there would be strong reason to suppose um, that, that it was happening. But um, you know, factoring large numbers isn't something you normally have to do to avoid getting hit by a bus. Um, so um, there's, there's that question. Um, the quantum no-cloning theorem I mentioned earlier offers an interesting perspective on human identity. Um, it's impossible to clone a quantum state, so whatever quantum state you have inside your brain cannot be copied. Uh, it's impossible to make um, an identical copy of, of, of you. Um, what about quantum gravity? Um, so quantum theory isn't the final theory, probably, of nature. Uh, um, that um, quantum gravity may be a, a further step in that direction. Let me explain what the problem of quantum gravity is. Um, so general relativity was the theory developed by Einstein. He completed that task um, over 100 years ago in 1915. And I think it stands as one of the supreme intellectual achievements um, in, in the history of ideas. Um, it's a beautiful uh, physical theory, um, both conceptually and, and mathematically. Um, in general relativity, space-time is curved. So if you have a mass, um, then space-time around that mass will, will, will become curved. Um, and not just space, but space-time. And what that means is that causal structure is dynamically determined uh, by the distribution of matter. Um, by causal structure, I mean um, the sequence of, sequence of events. What happens first? Which events are are space-like separated from one another, that means that they don't influence one another, or which events are time-like separated, that means that it's possible to go from one to the other. Uh, which events are before or after other events? So the causal structure is, is about that. Um, the problem of quantum gravity um, is to find a theory, maybe a new theory, that reduces inappropriate limits to general relativity on the one hand and to quantum theory on the other hand. Um, the holy grail of fundamental physics, I would say, is to find the correct theory of quantum gravity. This, this, this image of the holy grail is, um, is, is a, a relic in uh, North Wales that uh, some people believe to be the actual holy grail. Uh, th there are apparently 200 such relics around, around Europe. Um, So, um, so let's think about that a bit. In, uh, in quantum theory, we have this situation where you can have two things that look like they're mutually incompatible, but they happen at the same time. The particle goes along path one and also along path two at the same time. In general relativity, the causal structure is dynamically determined and that means that in quantum gravity, you would expect to have different causal structures, um, incompatible causal structures happening, so to speak, uh, in parallel, um, both being true. Um, yeah, so, so in quantum gravity, we expect that there is no matter of the fact as to what the causal structure is. Well, actually, we expect that there are many matters of the fact as to what causal structure is, uh, all uh, simultaneously true. Um, and uh, I call that indefinite causal structure. This is where you, you can't say um, if two events are space-like separated, so they don't influence each other, or if they're time-like separated. Uh, you would have something like a quantum superposition of before and after and after and before. If, y if you had this, then you would no longer be able to think of having a sequence of time steps at the fundamental level. This is a very basic idea that we, 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 we have, that, that, um, that you can imagine uh, the universe as, as, as um, evolving through a sequence of time steps, but fundamentally it looks like quantum gravity is telling us that that won't be the case. So why have I told you all this? Um, um, well, we could imagine um, quantum gravity computers. These would be computers that um, operate according to the, the, the laws of quantum gravity. We don't actually have a, a fully functional theory of quantum gravity yet, uh, but we can still think about what it would be like. 
Um, so a, the deep lesson from quantum computation is that when you change the physical theory, you also change the theory of computation. You know, every time the physical theory changes, the theory of computation that you imagine being possible also changes. Um, so we would have uh, a new theory of computation in the context of quantum gravity. Uh, could quantum gravity computers do more, go beyond quantum computers? Um, perhaps um, indefinite causal structure uh, could be used as a resource in computing um, and one that you don't have available uh, in quantum computers. Uh, it's conceivable even that quantum gravity computers could answer uh, questions, non-computable questions, which cannot be answered on a classical or a quantum computer. Uh, this is all, of course, wild speculation since we don't have such a theory, um, but we can ask these questions. Is the brain a quantum gravity computer? Um, well, one, one way to ask that question is to look at the, the, the scales involved. Uh, and if you take the fundamental constants that appear in physics and you play around with them, then you can create, um, you can create uh, what's called a Planck length, uh, a Planck mass, and uh, a Planck time. And the Planck mass is, um, well, 2 times 10 to the minus 8 kilograms, about uh, so 2 times 10 to the minus 5 grams, which is about the mass of a grain of sand. It's actually quite, you know, it's quite big. You, you can see a Planck mass. Um, and um, this, is likely, this is likely going to be the scale, the mass scale at which we see superpositions of different causal structures. In principle, this could happen in the brain. Uh, again, speculation, but in principle, this could happen. Could quantum gravity explain human cognition and consciousness? Well, on the cognition front, um, um, then we're perhaps in new territory. Uh, if you no longer have this picture where you have a sequence of time steps, um, then perhaps uh, these computers uh, could do things that, um, that classical and quantum computers cannot. You might think of this as being um, a bit like being able to see into the future a little bit. Um, if you have indefinite causal structure, then, then in the vicinity of some point, then, um, then, then uh, these, these events could somehow be connected that might normally be regarded as being in the future. Uh, I'm talking in heuristic terms here. Um, so on the cognition front, it's conceivable that quantum gravity could help. Um, consciousness, can you explain the hard, uh, can you solve the hard problem of consciousness? Can you, um, um, can you make any progress on, on those three questions I raised? I, I don't see how that works. I, I don't see the explanatory umph. Um, yeah. Okay, let's um, let's talk about some more philosophical issues. So so far we've talked about what you might call materialist accounts of matter, um, but philosophers have talked about many different sorts of sorry, materialist accounts of consciousness. We talked about um, accounts of consciousness in terms of matter. Uh, but philosophers have talked about uh, a broader set of possible accounts. Um, so here, here are the, the various sorts of accounts uh, of consciousness that uh, you can find. Um, so the three basic um, uh, accounts of, matter of consciousness uh, here in this table. So uh, accounts of consciousness that only have matter, you could think of that as being um, materialism this is um, just, just you know, li like the standard sort of model of physics. Um, and then you want to, um, you want consciousness to somehow be emergent. Um, and, and that kind of account of consciousness faces the, the hard problem uh, and all the very simple problems I mentioned. Um, but it's still, I think, where most of us are. Most of us think that this is ultimately the way to go. Uh, but it's worth considering uh, other ideas. Philosophers have talked about panpsychism. This is still a materialist account, but in addition to the normal properties associated with matter, there's also some sort of fundamental consciousness uh, property you know, that's, that lives there in, in the fundamental theory. So you don't have to have consciousness emerging because it's already there in, 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 in the fundamental theory. And, and philosophers do, do um, think about that. Um, 
And then the other kind of account is where you have both matter and you add something. Um, and this will be mind-matter duality. So this was perhaps you know, more popular um, in, in, in earlier centuries, the sort of um, uh, René Descartes talked about um, th th this sort of approach. Um, um, so you imagine that you have matter and then you have mind as, as, a, as a sort of ontologically distinct, um, um, when I say ontologically, I mean it's something that's still real, but it's ontologically distinct as, as different thing, and that uh, minds inhabit conscious systems. So from a scientific point of view, this sounds like a very radical idea, and it's, it's a long way from, from where most of us are. Um, on the other hand, uh, it's an idea that we can consider, and so I want to do that a little bit. Um, if, we, if we take one of these accounts of consciousness where, um, where, where there's something added to the theory, um, then here's an argument against um, what the philosophers call in this context uh, epiphen epiphenomenalism. So you might argue that, um, that, 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 that there is a mind uh, and a brain, but the mind, all the mind does is observe the brain. It doesn't in any way influence uh, the functioning of the brain. It's just some sort of passive observer. Um, here's an argument from Ewan Squires, who was actually my PhD supervisor. He, he points out that the word consciousness appears in the dictionary in black ink. So the atoms in that black ink uh, must have been influenced um, indirectly, of course, by whatever it is uh, in, in the ontology that is responsible for consciousness. Um, so, let's go back to this travel dictionary. Um, interestingly, the word conscious or consciousness, those words are not in the Scrabble dictionary. Um, uh, um, which tells us that Scrabble players, like Ben Schumacher, are, <laughs> are, are, are zombies. Um, but since the word consciousness does appear in good dictionaries, we can conclude that the, the behavior of matter uh, 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 can be affected by the ontological elements that are responsible for, con for consciousness. If we take seriously a sort of Cartesian dualist point of view, then we tell a story in which the mind acts on the brain and thereby imparts information into, sort of into, into the, sort of the, the world of these atoms, the physical world cor corresponding to these atoms, and then somewhere down the line that leads to a certain configuration of uh, atoms, of ink atoms in the dictionary. So the atoms uh, inside the brain, I if you tell that kind of story, then, then the atoms inside the brain it themselves would have to actually violate the laws of, of, of physics. Um, uh, we could attempt to look inside the mind to actually see this. You know, so here's a picture of um, Alan Turing. Um, you can imagine looking inside the mind to see uh, if we see some violation of quantum theory or whatever um, we regard to be the correct theory of physics. But it's very difficult to do an experiment like that. How would we know uh, if the atoms were really violating quantum theory? It's a very messy environment. We wouldn't have control over the initial conditions, so we couldn't really say anything. Um, so I want to propose um, a, a test uh, for mind-matter duality. It's, 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 um, it's not something I think, um, I mean, it's a test we can do. And um, in fact, I, I'm going to talk about an actual, uh, an actual um, uh, collaboration on that experiment. Um, but it, it's not something I think is really going to turn up to prove mind-matter duality, but it's a way of thinking about this question. Um, so I need to tell you a bit about Bell experiments. Um, so in a Bell experiment, you have um, a source of particles, um, and they're entangled. So you could have two qubits, for example, and they get entangled, they interact with each other, and then they separate out. Um, and then you make measurements at each end. And the way it works is that it, at, at, um, at one end, you, at each, at each end, you have a, a choice of measurement. It's a setting. Uh, and then you make the measurement, and then you have an outcome for that measurement. So you have that same situation at each end. And now we make an assumption. We assume locality. We assume that the outcome at end B does not depend on setting A. And likewise, the outcome at end A does not depend on setting B. If you make that assumption, then you can show that a certain correlation, a certain 
correlation function that you can measure is less than or equal to two. However, quantum theory predicts that this correlation is equal to 2.8. Um, it seems in quantum theory that one end knows what um, the setting at the other end is. You cannot actually use this correlation to send, this quantum correlation to send information faster than light. Um, you can't use it to communicate. It's merely something to infer from the statistics. So this is something that is, is, is deeply shocking when you first come across it, uh, certainly to a physicist, because locality is a very basic idea in physics. Um, so how do you impose these locality conditions? So to be sure that we impose locality conditions, we need to switch the setting at one end so there's no time for information about the setting at that end to reach the other end. So here, here's a graphic, you make a switch, the information spreads out and you have to complete the experiment before this information has reached the other end. So people have done lots of experiments now to test, um, to test this, to sh prove this, show this correlation. Um, and usually the switching is done by a random number generator. So the thing here that does the switching is a random number generator. But what if that random number generator is really a deterministic machine? Um, if this was really a deterministic machine, um, then it would have some sort of state, some hidden state, uh, at the earlier time, and you could use that to predict what the future setting was going to be. So if this thing is deterministic, um, not truly random, then um, you could you'd have an earlier state you could use to predict the later state, and you could send that information from one end to the other end. So the information about the, what the switch, so what the setting is going to be over here, would already be present uh, over here. Okay. What about if you use humans? So if you take seriously this idea of, um, of, of mind-matter duality, you could imagine that these kinds of interventions uh, of mind on matter cannot be anticipated, so to speak, um, by the laws at the physical level. Uh, and so, then um, what you could do is you could get humans to do the switching uh, and then you'd be able to impose the locality conditions. Um, so the idea is to perform a Bell experiment where you use humans to switch the settings. Um, and the idea is that this would be, um, this would truly um, you know, be test doing, doing the experiment that, um, that Bell had originally imagined. Now so far, no experiments have been done with humans that satisfy these locality conditions. So, what's the proposed experiment? Um, it's a slightly scary picture. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, we, we could imagine um, having humans that push a button to choose settings. However, we, we know that uh, it takes about one, cent one tenth of a second from when you make a decision to when you press the button. Um, and so in one tenth of a second, um, it was possible um, for a light speed signal to carry information about the setting that, it, uh, that is several times the radius of the overwave. So there's no way on a f in a terrestrial experiment to actually impose these locality conditions if you, get, um, if you get people just pressing buttons, it doesn't work. So the proposal instead is to use um, EEG signals directly because uh, you can get this information then from the decision much more quickly uh, to the experiment. So imagine that we have um, an experiment like the one I described. We need, for the statistics, we need to have more than one person. So I'm proposing maybe 100 people at each end. And then we collect information from the EEG signals and we use it to determine the settings. Um, and then we perform the experiment in, in that way. Um, So I wrote a paper on that in, 2000 and in May 2017. If you suppose the, 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 um, the entanglement is over about 100 kilometers, which was the record at that time, and you have 100 people at each end, and you imagine that people are able to perform about 10 switches per second, um, then you'd see a 1% effect, which is not very big, but just about uh, resolvable. Um, 
But then, um, so I talk about the beginning of a collaboration on an actual experiment. Uh, uh, in July 2017, this paper came out. This is a satellite-based uh, entanglement distribution over 1,200 kilometers, um, which, is, um, which is kind of remarkable. So they have a satellite. On the satellite, they have a source of pairs of photons, um, uh, and those photons go, well, I'll show you a picture in a minute. Those photons go to base stations, and they're able to um, do a, a test of the Bell experiment without humans so far. Um, um, which is significant, uh, statistically, statistically significant. So this is the group. It's the group of Jean Wei Pan, um, and the person I've been speaking to is is Yuan Ying here. Um, uh, so this is this is really an extraordinary um, advance on what was possible before. So here's the satellite that they launched. Um, and here's how it works. So you have the, um, the satellite up there. It transmits pairs of photons, uh, which can be picked up at these telescopes at ground stations. Um, the satellite goes around the planet once per day. And so every night, um, the satellite is in the right position for about 90 seconds. And during those 90 seconds, you can, um, you can get about 90 um, events um, so one, one, one per second. So the statistics aren't very good, um, but nevertheless, it's strong enough to, to see a violation of bell inequalities. Um, so if we had this kind of distance and 100 people at each end, and we imagine a 10 hertz uh, per person switching rate, then we could expect to see close to a 100% effect of the sort I'm talking about. It's extremely unlikely that quantum theory will be violated. And since the moment, quantum theory has been tested in, in, in many different situations, uh, and it's always come out uh, on top. Um, I, I would personally be very surprised. Uh, on the other hand, if quantum theory were violated in this situation, then it would have a very radical implications for our understanding of human mind. And also, incidentally, for our understanding of fundamental physics as well. It would tell us that um, physics was fundamentally local, uh, and also uh, that, that physics was in some sense super deterministic, which is, um, you know, in, in order, f um, the idea that the, that the early, inf the, 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 the switching, these um, devices that switch the setting, the mechanism I was proposing was that the earlier state could be transmitted to the other end, and, and that you could use that to predict what the later state is going to be. That seems like a very unlikely mechanism, and it's called super determinism in the literature. Anyway. Um, but nevertheless, this is an experiment we can we can do, and so um, I think it's worth, you know, worth any experiment is worth doing if it, it could um, if, if if it would have such radical implications. Okay, so conclusions. So first of all, uh, 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 from the point of view of this talk, at least a more practical conclusion, which is that if quantum phenomena are pertinent to brain function, then eventually. Um, neuroimaging needs to um, find a way to probe these quantum phenomena. And this raises challenges as we cannot extract all quantum information. Uh, so we have to ask questions about what, what would be the approach here, what, what information would we extract. Um, quantum computing and, and perhaps quantum gravity offer new ways to look at consciousness and cognition. My, my feeling is that neither of them really offer a way to solve the hard problem of consciousness, um, um, but there, there may be some light spread on cognition, perhaps if you go beyond quantum theory to quantum gravity. There are deep philosophical problems with providing an account of how matter creates thought, uh, uh, even if we evoke um, um, new uh, models of computation. Um, how you solve the hard problem of consciousness is still opaque to me. Um, um, so yeah, that, that's, that's the question. That, that sort of motivates perhaps considering more radical ideas. So one radical idea is, 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 is something like mind matter duality. And I, I proposed here uh, an experiment, um, even though it's very unlikely that quantum theory would be violated. I think this experiment at least offers us a, a way to discuss the sorts of radical ideas in, in, in a more scientific way. Um, 
what one thing I, I, in the abstract I, I said I was going to talk about that I realized preparing the talk I didn't have time was uh, to discuss how agents are central in, in the mathematical formalism of quantum theory. Uh, quantum theory is a very strange theory when you start to study it. And you see that it, it seems to evoke uh, a notion of agents who both make choices uh, and, and, um, and observe outcomes. So the quantum state has provides um, information about mutually incompatible choices agents might make. And why does it do that? Why does the quantum state tell us about different things that agents might do? Um, uh, and then also the quantum state is, is affected by observations. Uh, I, don't have a, I don't have an understanding of, of what this means as far as consciousness is concerned, but it, it may be something uh, that we can think about. And, uh, oh, just one more, um, more general point. Um, the field of quantum computing started when people started taking a different attitude to the philosophical problems that were raised by quantum theory. Rather than wringing their hands, they decided to ask in and, and, and to worrying about them, they decided instead to um, try to use this sort of quantum weirdness to do new things, to, 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 um, to build faster computers and to, and to have better sorts of information processing. Uh, and in doing that, we started to understand uh, quantum theory a bit better. And I wonder if a similar sort of attitude is possible with consciousness. Uh, if we embrace the problem of consciousness and try to put it to work, uh, uh, that's probably a better approach to actually do something practical. Uh, in so doing, we may ultimately gain a better understanding of, of, of where consciousness comes from uh, in, in the first place. Thank you. Fascinating stuff. Uh, uh, my mind is racing with, with questions, but I think we go to the audience first. Any questions, please? Right there. I mean, I, I simply don't have the expertise to really answer that question. I mean, but, but picking up one thing you said, there isn't really a time scale associated with quantum computing. So you can make a quantum compute, you can impose whatever time step structure on it once. It, 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 well, I mean, it, the, the, com the computer will have a time step. It will, you will go, you will, you will, you will perform, you know, um, have a certain time step associated with that to be whatever you want it to be. But when it comes to solving problems, it can be much faster than a classical computer just because it's better suited to those problems. Yeah, but your other question, which is the more substantial question, I, I simply, I don't have the expertise to answer it, but I think it's the pertinent question to ask if, um, if there's any real basis for believing that um, those processes. What one, and one, one study, so um, the real, the thing that really makes quantum theory, the, th the thing that really kills quantum processes is something called decoherence. Um, um, if, if a quantum system starts interacting with other systems that you're not looking at, so that aren't part of, of uh, aren't relevant, um, uh, and noise is something that could do that, then it, it kills the superposition. The superposition, the superposition stops being um, effective, uh, and so a quantum computer would be very quickly um, would, would very very quickly reduced to just an ordinary classical computer if 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 there's if there is a lot of decoherence uh, and, and interaction with noise would, would do exactly that. And a, a guy called Max Tegmark did calculations. Showing that, um, showing that, um, um, well, claiming to show that you couldn't really have quantum computation in the brain. Now he was thinking in terms of chemical comp quantum computation, whereas the proposal of Matthew Fisher uh, is, is where the qubits are held at, at the nuclear level. So that may be around Tegmark's, um, that may get around Tegmark's um, objections. Uh, but it's, it's an area of active study and I'm, I'm not sufficiently expert to give you a, 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 a more detailed answer than that. Uh, 
I think they're just entirely different mechanisms. So um, um, I, um, I think neither neither people tend to support the other mechanism. So sort of the objection to the microtubules is that um, is that um, these decoherence effects would um, would would kill quantum coherence. Now Stuart Hamhoff doesn't believe that. He thinks that you can have quantum coherence in those microtubules, um, whereas Matthew Fisher thinks I understand that 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 interaction with the environment would very quickly kill um, the quantum uh, coherence so you'd get quantum decoherence um, yeah that, that that's that's the best I know um, but that, that but they are different proposals for how you might have quantum phenomena in the thing about that, but it's, it sounds like an interesting question. Um, yeah, let's see. Um, so you're talking about the computational complexity of solving this protein. Yeah, I've, I've heard people talk about this. Um, it, it might be that protein folding falls into the same kind of um, complexity class from a computational point of view as factoring numbers. I, I don't actually know the answer to that question, but maybe someone in the audience does. Um, and um, yeah, it, it could be. I, I don't know the answer. Yes. Yeah. So just well, no. It's all. It's all. It doesn't solve PF versus MP, but it, it, the, it's um, it's a, it's a more restrictive thing anyway. So there is a field of quantum chaos, um, and um, 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 again, I, I'm, I'm not an expert on, on quantum chaos. People study it. I mean, in classical chaos is quite different. It's where you, you have um, chaotic behavior, but it's actually fundamentally deterministic. It's just extreme sensitivity to initial conditions. So it appears to be probabilistic, but fundamentally it, it's not. It's deterministic. Um, and that's quite different from the sort of probability the sort of uh, statistical behavior you see in quantum theory where it's fundamentally um, probabilistic. There's no way in principle of, of um, determining what's going to happen um, when you make a measurement in quantum theory. Um, yeah, ab about the field of quantum chaos, I, I, don't, I don't know much about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so certainly, so there are, there's a difference between operate what you can do operationally. So in quantum theory, operationally, it's impossible to predict what's going to happen, you have to resort to probabilities. But you can nevertheless invoke hidden variables which, um, which, um, which in principle would allow you, which, which in principle determine what, what happens, but you can't measure those hidden variables. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> these are all good questions. I don't know the answer to. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do we do we need to update the theory test? Oh right. Yeah. Um, I mean, in some ways, the, the experiment I proposed there's a there's a 
a sort of inverse Turing test almost. You have um, uh, in the Turing test, you, um, you um, Turing was trying to show that you, you know, ultimately computers could do the same as humans, and that I think that was the result he was hoping for. Um, uh, and in so doing, he invented the theory of computation. But um, um, whereas here I'm proposing a test where where um, where um, humans would do something that that that, that, that machines could not do. Um, yeah, uh, but in terms of if it has a role in in, in, in therapy, I I, I I I don't know the answer to that. I, I think it's yeah, it's too I think it's too soon. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. I would say I would say there was a there, there was a dis there was a distinct parts of the talk. So the quantum gravity, so the experiment was different from that. So it, in in the in that part of the talk that I talked about quantum computing and quantum gravity, I, I was I was sh just talking about how if you change the physics, then your theory of computation changes also, uh, and and that may shed some light on on questions to do with consciousness and cognition. Um, and then when I talked about the experiment, that was. Uh, really an experiment to test a radical idea that there may be a, a duality of, of mind and matter, sort of, you know, in some ways a, 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 a pre-scientific idea almost. Um, uh, and, but we could do an experiment and... Um, and, and, and right. Um, but if you, if you had a friend who could factor 400 digit numbers <laughs> in, in a second, then that would be compelling. Um, um, yeah, other than that, I, I think it's worth addressing that. Uh, you so th there's the, the here, here in this institute, the, there's, 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 um, there's sort of graphical models of, of, of brain processing uh, are used and extracted from the data. Uh, and it maybe one could extrapolate that and start to see that you needed to invoke um, quantum degrees of freedom to, to explain what was happening. Um, I think that's a long way from, from, from where data acquisition is at the moment, but you could imagine that in, in the long term, finding that there were processes that couldn't be explained easily without invoking a quantum process, without evoking some sort of quantum component. So I have a I have a variation on this experiment, uh, which is that you build two or more robots like that, and you just get them talking to each other, you know, shooting the breeze, and um, um, but you have to be very careful that you you specifically don't ask they don't have you have to be careful that it's that it's it's you know that you have sort of um, conceptual hygiene if you like you don't give them the concept of consciousness up front, and then you see if they start discussing the hard problem of consciousness. Um, and if they do, then I think that's very compelling evidence. Because, um, uh, you know, there's been experiments where they've got computers talking to each other and they even invent their own words. Um, so, so this is the sort of experiment you could imagine running. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I think it's an interesting comment. I, I, I have nothing to add to what you said. I think it's a question that one can ask. Yeah.
complete your question really on speed, uh, you need to get, so the experiment, um, if it's 1,200 kilometers wide, then um, um, that corresponds, so it's light, um, so it takes light um, of four microseconds to travel, uh, having a couple of micro to travel um, that distance. So you've only got four microseconds, you've got less than four microseconds to extract the information from the, um, the participant. And even with EEG signals, um, it's quite difficult because you can't discriminate different EEG signals on that time scale. Uh, it takes about 100 microseconds to do that. And if you're talking about pressing buttons, then the time you that you then you're just completely um, you're in a different ballpark, and, it, and it's a tenth of a second, so that's already several times the radius of, of, of the Earth. Um, so from my point of view, it's really about speed, just getting the information out quickly and, and proposing EEG as, as a way to do it. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if it, it, would be, it would be nice to, to know that we were measuring the right thing, but it would be a, a strategy if the experiment was done and we were measuring the wrong thing and, 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 and we didn't see the effect and so we, we missed this. Um, you'd, you'd want to be measuring something that corresponded to, you know, choicey behavior, you know, humans making decisions because uh, that's, that's the kind of thing we expect to be related to, to, um, to, to, um, to, to be the, the right kind of thing that might, be, might provide these sorts of, um, you know, minds on brain interventions. But um, but in the in the absence of a theory, it's just it's just guesswork. And, and um, yeah. I feel like the question you're asking is a, is a, is a deeper one than I'm <laughs> I, can, I can think of an answer I'm for in such. I think so this this is a good question. I, I I think I have to get back to you. I, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I will take three more questions. In, yeah, in quantum interferometry. Yeah. So, so going back to the interferometer, um, if, if you don't make a measurement in the middle, so if you don't put detectors in the middle, um, then you'll see this phenomenon that I mentioned um, where, um, where 
where, where yeah, if, if, the, um, if the preference are equal and the chromodelta is C, if the preference are different by that certain amount, the chromodelta is D. Um, whereas if you make a measurement, you don't see that. Um, and so it matters when you make the measurement. Um, and in the, ca in the case where you don't make the measurement, then both, both things that could have happened are playing the role and contributing to what you see later. So in the case of causal structure, it could be that, that both the, the, the two different causal structures you could possibly have end up contributing to, to some events you see down the line. Um, and, and those measurements you make later wouldn't tell you which of the two causal structures you had earlier, so to speak. Um, I, I'm talking heuristically, because we, we don't, uh, I'm talking heuristically because we don't actually have a theory of quantum gravity to talk about this. So it, so it does make a difference when you, you make the measurement. So you, you're asking if um, but by, by making uh, a computer quantum, if, if um, you, you change your definition of consciousness in, in some way. Um, I mean, it might change the sort of conscious experience experiences you'd have, you know, what they are. Um, um, you know, sometimes people joke that, you know, that, 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 that they often feel very fuzzy Anyway, and that's because their brains are, are, are quantum. But uh, you know, maybe um, if if we were somehow directly aware of quantum states, we would have a different set of ex experiences than the ones you have um, if it was just a classical uh, state. Um, yeah, so that that's possibly true. Um, I, I still don't see how you actually solve the problem, the hard problem of consciousness. But that's a separate question. Which observation was it? Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can't see a mechanism where you'd use that. Um, it would, yeah, I don't see it. But uh, something like that.
Um, so certainly I can imagine those kinds of experiments helping us determine I if quantum theory was playing a role in, in the brain. You know, if you, if you had some auxiliary quantum systems attached to the brain, if, that, if, that, if, if quantum theory was playing a role, that might actually help um, processing. Um, um, so on the cognition front, it may shed some light. Uh, but on, on, the, um, on, the, on, on the problem of consciousness, the hard problem of consciousness, I, I, I still don't see it. Uh, I still don't see how you're making that explanatory leap. Um, but maybe, I, I just don't see it. Okay. So um, I think life imitates art. I think we're uh, getting closer and closer to uh, asking the ultimate question of life taking 4.2 million years to answer the question. The answer is 42. Is <laughs> how many, yeah, I was probably wondering how many people would understand that reference. But uh, I think this has been a, a fascinating excursion in, into uh, some very, very uh, wild ideas that I think we all find uh, fascinating. We could talk for hours over beer, but we have to stop now. And uh, uh, Dr. Hardy is around for a couple more hours if people have burning questions they want to, to get at, but uh, for now, Thank you very much, Lucy, and fabulous talk. I also want to say there's coffee and some coffee and cookies and tea, so hang around, chat. And again, thank you very much for coming out. And one of the things I'd like to do is just take a photo to put out onto Facebook just to show everyone how many people actually came out today. Thank you so much. And follow us on the Ludmere Center if you want to come to more of these types of lectures. <laughs> They are, f most of our lectures are free and you're more than welcome to join us. Thank you. I hope it wasn't too speculative. But, uh, well, I mean, this, uh, these kinds of things, as I said, are, you know, fascinate people. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, people go off the rails. Right, yeah, uh, that's the worry. Uh, it's a hard okay.